the next few minutes, Dr. Phil Koo from MD Anderson Banner in Phoenix and myself will discuss the recent publication of Radar 3. And Radar 3 follows on to publication Radar 1 and Radar 2. Uh, Radar 1 is still one of the most downloaded publications in prostate cancer. Radar 3 builds on that and incorporates next generation imaging, we call this NGI, and we're fortunate to have uh, sharing this podium with me, um, Dr. Ku, who will give us some insight into that. So our outline is we're going to talk about Radar 1, Radar 2, the rationale for Radar 3, we have an inter introduction, methods to evaluate non uh, next generation imaging modalities, pet tracers, clinical impacts, and recommendations of the Radar 3 group. Radar 1 uh, was published in Urology in 2014. It's my, myself, Dr. Stone, and several others, uh, including Dr. Koo. And the idea behind Radar 1 was that when you looked at imaging for prostate cancer, there was a problem. There was all these guidelines, but they really didn't make sense. And the, the, we, 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 we saw three areas of concern. And the publication is right here. It was a review article in urology. So what we decided was we would get a group of um, concerned experts together, review all the guidelines out there, uh, we did. We found you know, good, bad, and ugly, but no confirmed consensus in a number of areas. So we have all these guidelines out there, the Clinical Trial Working Group, American College of Radiology, European Society of Clinical Oncology, AUA, European, but they really didn't, didn't apply in all areas where we thought they should, and that should be when to, when to do uh, imaging in newly diagnosed cases, when to do imaging and biochemical failure, and when to do it in metastatic disease. And so we came up with these buckets here, newly diagnosed patients, and basically we said, because what, what happens, somebody comes in Gleason 6 cancer, uh, PSA of 8, and they got a radical prostatectomy, but before they, or radiation, before they got that, they got a CT scan and a bone scan. And that happened a lot. And people say, well, it's a medical legal issue and things like that. Um, so we, we said, hey, you're actually doing more harm than, than, uh, than advantage to the patient. So we said, when do you do a bone scan? When, when two of the three things are present, PSA greater than 10, Gleason score 7 or above, or palpable disease. You have to have two of those. Biochemical failure, when do, you, when do you image people? We basically said, you actually can have metastatic disease with a low PSA, but between 5 and 10, and then the second one, when the PSA is above 20 and so forth, and then that's the biochemical. And then the M0 castrate-resistant patients, those are the ones that have PSAs going up and they have uh, negative imaging. How often do you image them? Well, you can, you can have met, uh, progression metastatic disease, and we've shown this when PSA is less than 2. So the recommendations for imaging for radar 1 was basically we had technetium bone scan, abdominal pelvic CT scan, uh, we had other things out there, sodium fluoride, PET, MRI, and other things that can use at discretion. So we really didn't have anything. There was inconsistency in the literature. Uh, there was probably underdiagnosis of metastatic disease, particularly in the M0 space, and early detection of metastases seems important for optimal patient management. Radar 2, we got the, pretty much the same group together two years ago, and the goal was how do we deal with all these new drugs and how do we layer them? And that was called the role of therapeutic layering and optimizing treatment for patients with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And we coined that term, therapeutic layering, and you see a lot of people doing that right now, using that term, therapeutic layering. And so the goal was a consensus on sequencing. Uh, how, do you, how do you go from one drug to another? What drugs do you put together and so forth? And the, so what is combination therapy? That's in which two or more therapies are initiated simultaneously, which is different than therapeutic layering as defined by our working group, which is basically where one or more agents are added on top of one. So you don't stop it necessarily. Uh, we're already doing it in prostate cancer because we're building upon 
uh, the foundation of ADT. And then we may use uh, Provence or something like that, radium, things like that. And then we build on with abiraterone, enzalidomide, chemotherapy, and things like that. So that's therapeutic layering. And basically, it's, uh, you know, we have both asymptomatic metast uh, metastatic CRP and symptomatic metastatic CRP, see we're talking about. We always want to have best support, supportive care, bone, things like that, ADT, a strong foundation. And then we have all these things we can throw in there, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, things like that. So the most effective sequence, combination of that uh, therapeutic layering, we want to talk about optimal timing, sequencing, combination agents. We have a lot of tools to use, androgen pathway inhibitors, um, and that is our drugs like uh, abiraterone, enzalidomide, um, apalutamide is not in that space I'm talking about right now, radium-223, uh, and cipolucyl-T. So conclusions from RADAR2 was despite great style at strides in the management of, of metastatic CRPC, selecting a treatment to optimize outcomes was a challenge. MCRPC is best managed by different agents, different times, unique and complementary mechanisms of action. Optimal treatment selection may depend on the molecular characterization. We're getting better at this. Genotyping, ARB7s, we've got a lot of stuff that's happening. Clinical trials remain important, and the working group recommendations are based on available trial literature and real world experience uh, in patients with the disease. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Ku, who was one of the pivotal people in the RADAR3 uh, study. So, Phil, you want to? Well, first off, the story of radar, I think, is very, very uh, inspiring. And per personally, it's probably been the most rewarding experience in my professional career. And, and I think all the credit really goes to Dave for foreseeing issues or identifying problems in advanced prostate cancer, coming up with a solution, and getting a multidisciplinary group together to actually tackle that issue. And then beyond that, I think, What's special about what was done is he was able to corral a group of people who had strong feelings about a lot of these topics and get them to agree on something. And you can imagine how difficult that would be, but there was actually pretty good consensus. You know, with Radar 1 and Radar 2, yeah, there wasn't a ton of fighting. I think in the end, when you base it on what's available and you have, you know, open discussions, I think you can come up with these, these good solutions that I think have been pretty applicable and pretty groundbreaking. I mean, the Radar 1, again, most downloaded article for several years. It's been cited numerous, numerous times as a review article. And then number two, or Radar 2, this idea of therapeutic layering, right? We, before that article, I think everyone was talking about sequencing. A, then B, then C, then D. And all of a sudden, we realized that's not true. And, and I'm going to talk about that later with Radium 223. But, you know, this idea of therapeutic layering is critical. And I think that sort of laid the groundwork for that. So, you know, when he came up with this idea for Radar 3, which we actually talked about in Radar 1, this idea of the impact of these better imaging tools, you know, it was very exciting. And I think we all knew this was going to have a huge impact on how we, we manage care uh, and how this would impact that care. So uh, the objectives for Radar 3 was to understand the potential use of novel imaging modalities in the initial staging of prostate cancer, in patients with biochemical recurrence, uh, patients who are non-metastatic, or metastatic, and then those patients who are castration-resistant prostate cancer. So it took radar one, it sort of added a couple more buckets and, and provided recommendations with regards to how we might be using these in the future. Um, and then number two, to understand the rationale for obtaining these scans, the frequency of ordering them, and understanding the integration of the results into clinical decision-making treatment algorithms. I think that's something that we don't talk about enough. When you order an imaging test, I think we need to think about how that is going to impact your decision making. And we talked about that yesterday with Locate. That's, that's important. That's not the end, and that's not the most important factor that we need to be focused on, because I think the most important thing is outcomes. But first, we do need to have a plan even before that. So I think those were our main objectives. All right, so, oh, there are more objectives. To gauge the rapidity and ease of uptake of these novel imaging modalities among medical oncologists and uro urologic oncologists who practice in different settings around the country. One thing we realized was, at the time that we met, there was a lot of confusion with regards to what's available, what's the best tool, uh, and we sort of 
talked about that because there are a lot of geographic variations and we came up with our recommendations with regards to what might be best, especially in the United States. To redefine the existing terminology that does not accurately represent the changing landscape in biochemically recurrent non-metastatic or metastatic prostate cancer, and then to update the existing radar one and two recommendations based on the availability of recent data. All right, so obviously you're not going to be able to see this, but this just goes over all the different, not all, but sort of the more important different radiopharmaceuticals that are being discussed. Um, in the literature and in, in, in various settings. So the first one is FACBC, which is fluciclovine. Uh, we talked about that yesterday. C11-choline, which is something that we, again, heard a lot about, uh, especially when the FDA approved it in 2011 at the Mayo Clinic. We've heard a lot about gallium-68 PSMA, again, something that is available in the United States under an IND. It's more widely available in Europe. Uh, South America, Australia, and that's where we've seen a lot of the pioneering work with regards to the use of PSMA. And before we get too further, I just want to say that when we say PSMA, there are a lot of different subtypes of PSMA imaging agents, and that's for a whole other discussion, but for the time being, we're just going to focus on a couple of them. F18 DCFBC, that's something that was developed at Johns Hopkins. It's an F18-based PSMA imaging agent. It's been used more for patients for evaluating the primary disease at initial diagnosis as opposed to metastatic disease, but I think it might have a role in identifying metastatic disease as well. Um, DCF-PYL, I think this, this rate of tracer is interesting because it's currently being studied in a clinical trial uh, called Osprey that's sponsored by Progenix, uh, and we'll see, I think that's scheduled to close next month, and then we'll see the data from that that'll actually probably lead to the FDA approval for the first PSMA-based pet imaging agent in the United States. So stay tuned for that, because I think in the next couple of years, this is going to really change the discussion with regards to, to next generation imaging. And the final, final one is C11 acetate, which to be honest, I don't think we need to be speaking about anymore. Um, so when we looked at the data with regards to how these NGI tools have been studied, almost all the studies have been published looking at patients with biochemical recurrence. And, you know, this isn't all of them, but these are just a lot of them. And, and a lot of the work has been focused around choline, PSMA, and fluciclovine. And basically the takeaway is biochemical recurrence is where the data is most mature. And when you look at that data, it is, in general, overall, so much better than any of the tools we have had in the past. So when we compare this to conventional imaging, bone scans and CTs, you know, it, it's no, no longer in the discussion. That's why this is not just a step forward, this is 10 steps forward. Um, met, coverage is always a, an issue, and that's something that we heard when we you know, talked to various providers around the country. Uh, and this table just sort of provides an update with regards to the Medicare coverage status for, for these tools. So for fluciclovine, it is covered by all the different Medicare uh, uh, MACs around the country. C11 choline you know, was paid for, uh, but again, limited access, which made it a big issue. Sodium fluoride PET-CT, we talked about this yesterday, it is no longer reimbursed by CMS. So I think that's sort of going to put the nail in the coffin for sodium fluoride PET-CT. That being said, the tools that we have today, fluciclovine, PSMA, actually will perform better for bones than sodium fluoride did, but you actually get a bonus because the new next generation imaging techniques image soft tissues and bones in one exam. And that's a huge, huge advantage as opposed to getting two separate exams. And that's kind of why I sort of blew by that yesterday, but that's an important piece that we have to remember. It's, it's basically two tests in one. FDG PET-CT, it is approved. You know, CMS will pay for it. They pay for it under this thing called subsequent treatment strategy. It's not used to diagnose at initial diagnosis, but for patients later in the course of disease to look at maybe treatment response, it will be paid for. And I think there is a role for this, but we just need to develop that a little more in the future. Um, gallium-68 PSMA, it is not reimbursed by CMS. It's not FDA approved yet. But again, I think that'll change in the next year or two. So ERPC, not CRPC. Oh, this was a topic that uh, was very interesting, and I think this makes a lot of sense. So we recommended that um, to name the state estrogen-resistant prostate cancer as opposed to castration-resistant prostate cancer. And I'm not an expert on these hormones and, and, and that axis, but, you know, I'll leave that up to Dave. But 
Uh, the rationale for this terminology was suggested several years ago. The Radar 3 guidelines uh, include men experiencing PSA or other signs of progression after adequate ADT for any stage of prostate cancer be labeled ERPC. Men who experience progression after adequate ADT for biochemical progression and negative conventional imaging be labeled non-metastatic ERPC. And then have this category of non-metastatic ERPC asterisk which are those who are actually metastatic based on NGI. And I think that's something that we need to think about because we don't know enough about what metastatic disease with these NGI tools mean. Because all the studies that have been looked at for Spartan, Prosper, all these different things have used conventional imaging. So for us to make the assumption that, you know, because you're M1 with a flucicolene PET, you behave the same as an M1 on a bone scan. I think that's, that's not true, right? I would argue a patient with NGI who has metastatic disease, uh, they, would be, they might be M0 on a bone scan, but it's going to be different biology, you know, and that's something that we could talk about, you know, offline. But I think it's something that we need to think about. And by designating that category with an asterisk, it just sort of helps us categorize patients a little better to help our decision-making in the future. A similar system for positive imaging, uh, metastatic ERPC, metastatic ERPC asterisk, or STAR, uh, for metastatic disease. We believe these guidelines will better stratify men for future evaluations. And I think that is something that, you know, is going to set the stage for how we conduct research in the future. So our recommendations. Radar 3 recommends utilization of traditional scans with consideration for NGI only. If the traditional scans are equivocal or negative and the clinician still suspects disease progression based on various factors, but not limited to the following criteria, Gleason score, PSA levels, PSA velocity in untreated patients, patients meeting NCCN very high risk or locally advanced, N1 disease should be considered for NGI at initial diagnosis. And we'll go through that in more detail in this slide. So I think it's, it's, this is a, a nice slide that sort of takes us through the various buckets of disease states within castration resistant, or along the whole spectrum of prostate cancer. So if you look at the first column, it talks about, it gives, the first row gives our radar one recommendations, and then the second row gives our, our radar three recommendations. So if you have a patient comes in, low risk disease, don't do imaging, we know that. Imaging in low risk patients will not yield any good results. In fact, I think it'll lead to more indeterminate results, which is gonna to lead to more imaging, maybe biopsies and things that are unnecessary. Low risk patients don't have metastatic disease, let's not worry about it. If those patients do have two of the three criteria, then go ahead with a bone scan and CT. But some of those patients are gonna come back as either being negative or they're gonna come back with equivocal findings. And I wish I could be more definitive in a lot of my reports, but sometimes I can't. If you have those patients that are negative or equivocal and you still think there's metastatic disease somewhere, I think it's reasonable to think about using NGI to help you identify those sites of disease. If you're a patient with high risk uh, disease, high Gleason score, maybe you know, really high PSA level, and the bone scan and CT is negative, you're still a little concerned. I think that's a reasonable patient to go ahead with NGI. In the future, I think those high-risk patients, when we, once we have more data, I think they might go straight to NGI as opposed to wasting the resources of a bone scan and CT. But we're not there yet. So for the time being, I think that's the best strategy with regards to how you use NGI in patients who are newly diagnosed with prostate cancer. All right, so there, we're going to move forward. That patient then gets treated and then is biochemically recurrent. How do we use NGI at that point? Well, if you look at radar one, or radar one, we talk about using it when the PSA level um, is between five and ten, and then we talk about doubling, using it every doubling time. The, that was the biggest problem with conventional imaging: was you had to wait too long to see disease, so then you couldn't cure them, you couldn't intervene soon enough, and that gap between biochemical recurrence and when you might see someone with metastatic disease based on PSA level, it was too big. And we knew there was stuff going on that we just weren't seeing. NGI has unlocked that dark spot, that, that dark space. So our recommendations were consider NGI for PSA greater than or equal to 0 0.5. How did we come up with no, that number? You know, I wish I could say there was some you know, great scientific process, but there wasn't. 
You know, I think in the literature, we've seen more data that talks about higher detection rates of disease at lower PSA levels. Less than 0.1, we've seen detection rates range 60 to 80 percent, right? Zero, but we've seen data that shows that gallium-68 PSMA and even flaciclovine can detect disease at significant rates even below 0 0.5. So we left that up to the, the local teams to figure out what imaging tests are you doing, how confident does the team feel, and if you feel like you can get, you know, have had good success with PSA levels, let's say 0 0.2, 0 0.3, go for it. You know, but I think that's a local discussion that a lot of people need to have. So in this bucket, if you have a patient who's biochemically recurrent, I think it makes sense just to go straight to NGI. Why bother with the bone scan and CT? I don't see much value in that. Um, and eventually, I think it's just going to be replacing bone scan and CTs in general in that space. You can make the argument that you get a bone scan and CT, and if it's positive, great, you don't have to get NGI. But again, it's not going to be positive when the PSA level is that low. All right, so now that's biochemical recurrence. The patient moves on. They had, let's say they have no metastatic disease and they become castration resistant. Um, Radar 3 recommends the first CT and bone scan when the PSA level is greater than or equal to 2, um, and then for every doubling thereafter. Um, you know, this was an interesting discussion because, you know, in the past, we didn't have therapies for M0 or CRPC. And if that was the case, then there was probably more of a push to try to get patients to M1 or metastatic so you could start using the docetaxels, the, the radiums, the, the cipolucyl T. But now that we have therapies approved for M0 or CP, CRPC, what is the true value of NGI in that space? And I think the group decided that probably wasn't valuable, you know. Uh, but there was one scenario in which maybe it would be worth getting NGI. And that's when you wanted, the patient maybe isn't doing so well, and you wanted to get them into that M1 CRPC space so you could treat with those other drugs. And I think that is one scenario in which I think NGI might have a role. Um, again, and the reason why we said that was because Prosper, Spartan, all those trials were based on conventional imaging. They were based on bone scan and CT, not PSMA, not flaciclovine. If we go explore Prosper and Spartan, and especially Spartan, and I think this is going to be presented at SUO, there was a, a small subset of patients that did have NGI and actually had low volume metastatic disease, but they were negative on a bone scan and CT, and that's what allowed them to qualify for Spartan. So again, even though it was M0 CRPC, it was M0 based on conventional imaging. If we used NGI, they would have been M1 star. And then for patients with M1 castration-resistant prostate cancer, you know, we, we talk about the use in patients who might be progressing. Personally, I don't know if there's really a lot of value in that, in that because for you to compare, for you to determine progression, you need a baseline scan to compare that to. And all of a sudden, if you're comparing an NGI to a traditional bone scan, it's really hard to compare those two. So, and then to make the argument that you should be doing NGI every three months, six months, or 12 months to assess progression, I think is something might work down the line, but we haven't proven it. And without proving it, that's a lot of added costs to the care of a patient that we haven't shown that is actually accurate or beneficial. So I think that's another area that will be explored in the future, but for the time being, you know, something that we should be a little more careful about. That being said, NCCN, approves this for progression as well. So if you want to use it in that setting, I think it might have some value, especially if someone is progressing and you need something to help you demonstrate that. Uh, and we've seen some dramatic cases of patients where, you know, conventional imaging shows very little disease and, and on the flaciclovine petite, it's just remarkable how many metastatic lesions they have. All right, so conclusions. While traditional CT, MRI, and bone scans still have a role in initially diagnosing prostate cancer, NGI modalities are more sensitive in visualizing advanced prostate cancer. These new scans are recommend, recommended for select patients where aggressive intervention earlier may be indicated. Currently, the F18 flaciclovine PET scan is the NGI technique with the best combination of availability, specificity, and sensitivity in the U.S. PSMA PET CT scans show diagnostic potential, but likely won't be available for widespread use in the U.S. for several years. Our strongest recommendation for use of NGI is in patients with BCR prostate cancer. This is where the data are strongest and the likelihood of site-directed therapy is greatest for patients interested in such strategies. 
This group recognizes the lack of current efficacy and safety data. However, the purpose of a consensus manuscript is to provide guidance in an area where clinical decision making is less than certain. Hence, we believe the greatest potential impact to alter therapy and improve patient outcomes with NGI are in a setting where reintroduction of local therapy plus or minus systemic therapy has the greatest potential.